Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to Face to Face. Today we're coming to you from Toronto. It's here that we caught up with Riley Yesno, a proud Anishinaabe woman from the Abamatung First Nation in Northern Ontario, who grew up in Thunder Bay. To make Canada a good country, we have to believe that we can create an identity that serves us all. Riley has made quite a name for herself as a strong voice for Indigenous youth, a voice that has now been heard in national newspapers. The Honourable Member for University Rosedale. And all the way to the House of Commons in Ottawa. She is a political science and Indigenous studies student at the University of Toronto. Riley, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, I guess a little uh, first on how did you end up here in the University of Toronto, about 2,000 kilometers away from your home? Right, right. Well, I always, uh, so from Fort Hope, I moved away from Fort Hope or Amatung when I was quite young, so I think about eight or nine. And we moved to Thunder Bay, my whole family. Um, so that was a big difference, I know, from a lot of Indigenous youth in the city, too. My whole family got to come with me. And uh, I just always l love to see new things and go other places. And so I knew I wanted to get out of Thunder Bay, too, for a number of reasons. Right. Um, but I didn't uh, intend on being at the University of Toronto at all. I had uh, applied to art school. I was going to go to OCAD, actually. Okay. Uh, so I had accepted my offer, all those things, and then um, I kind of got on the Prime Minister's Youth Council and was thinking like, oh my God, like politics is definitely the, the avenue that I'm going to pursue now. So I rescinded my acceptance and uh, went to the University of Toronto, which I had applied for as a backup. So, so to take a few steps back, I guess, yeah. uh, you, like we said, you attended high school in Thunder Bay. Uh, what was that like for you? We often hear, uh, you know, many First Nations youth from the North have to go to high school in Thunder Bay and yeah. hear of the, the culture shock that it can be. For sure. I, I, again, was lucky because I was not 13 years old when I came, right? And so I had very much acclimated to what it's like to be living in a city drastically different than it is on the reserve. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the fact that my family was there with me and all of those things. Um, high school was difficult to be in Thunder Bay, but in, I think, a very different way than it is for a lot of the Indigenous kids from the North. Um, I am able to kind of... I was able to really hide a lot of my indigeneity, so nobody would ever ask me if I was, and I would never say it, because even still you would, uh, even though it was a way to kind of, you know, avoid the racism and, like, avoid having to deal with those tough conversations, or even your own friends and people around you would say, like, really anti-indigenous things, and so I was like, a way for me to just deal with this is just to pretend it doesn't exist. Who could blame her? In recent years, Thunder Bay has developed quite a reputation for the way Indigenous people have been treated, especially young students flying in from up north to attend Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School. The kids are forced to live far from home to get their education, and in recent years there has been a very disturbing trend. Between 2000 and 2011, seven young students died while boarding in the community, many under suspicious circumstances their bodies pulled from the river. But suspicious deaths of indigenous people in that community date back much further than that. Accusations that some Thunder Bay police held racist views led to a review entitled Broken Trust, headed by the independent police review director, Gary McNeely. It was released last year. I found that in my review of cases, Thunder Bay Police Service investigators, they failed on an unacceptably high number of occasions to treat or protect the deceased and his or her family equally and without discrimination because, because the deceased was indigenous. But Mayor Bill Morrow took issue with both reports and continues to blame them for bringing unfair national media attention to the city around its reputation and its treatment of students from up north. You didn't go to Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School. Uh, do you think that was a, a different experience for you, uh, not attending, you know, a school that's uh, set aside for Indigenous youth from the north? Yeah, well, it was 100% a different experience too, and it like, it was, 
I'm sure it had its pros and cons. I found, I think I probably would be, uh, would have had like a greater sense of like indigenous community as well if I had gone to Dennis, from, uh, Dennis Franklin. Mm -hmm. um, but I also know having been at one of those schools that would like play Dennis Franklin on sports teams and like go and do all those things that like there is um, a lot of prejudice associated uh, that other people have about DFC because of the people that go there, right? So. Uh, you, we mentioned you're a writer. You've written for the Toronto Star and Maclean's in many places, um, and you've written about uh, you know the the youth who have who have passed away in Thunder Bay and the rivers. Um, what can you tell us about that, and what informs your writing about that? Um, what really got it going for me was I worked with Nan Nishnabi Eski Nation up there for um, the past couple of years, and. Every sort of summer that I was working there, you would hear these stories of kids going missing. Even I was in Thunder Bay last week, and there was a young girl who was missing who was luckily found, but it's just like so constant. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving to places like Toronto, you know that if these kids were to go missing in, in the rate that they're going missing in uh, at in a place like this that it would just it would it would not happen there would be so many more interventions and things happening and etc and so i found that really appalling but also i think it's the same sort of thing that a lot of indigenous people i met feel when we talk about things like Colton Bushi or Tina Fontaine or stuff is that when an indigenous person is unjustly killed or dies or goes missing uh, it feels very personal um, and that's how it feels increasingly every single time a kid goes missing in Thunder Bay um, and so I also felt like this little bit keen sense of so there's so much passion but also this sense of responsibility um, to be able to to kind of hopefully maybe draw people's attention or wake somebody up or just make sure that like those stories get heard somebody who grew up there, heads back there all the time, is this uh, the national media's problem with Thunder Bay just like anywhere else? I mean, I think, I've always thought that Thunder Bay was like this really excellent microcosm for the rest of Canada. So yes, are there racism issues and police brutality issues and all of these things in other parts of the country? Sure. Uh, but what makes Thunder Bay, I think, such, such an important and unique case is that it is exacerbated you look at any sort of statistic I don't know like there's just so many stats and experiences and stories that can counter all of these mayor's claims like you know we're the hate crime capital of Canada we've been it's called murder bay like notoriously known um, and so I just think that uh, there's a lot of willful ignorance um, and probably internalized racism and prejudice on that part of those statements do you see things uh, as getting better there um, you wrote a story saying Thunder Bay needs to, to wake up and, yeah. and basically acknowledge what's going on. And do you think that that's taking place? I think marginally. Um, and again, to, to mirror the rest of Canada, you'll see like these little sort of changes. Um, you know, when the Massey lectures with Tanya Talaga came to Thunder Bay, that was the first time in my life I had ever seen Thunder Bay rally in any sort of way to talk about indigenous issues period they sold out the Thunder Bay Auditorium mm -hmm. you know they saw there's more than the trailer park boys when the trailer park is <laughs> that's how you know it was real so. I, I saw them there though too did you actually <laughs> yeah, at the community auditorium that's hilarious and the university I saw them a few times I, I didn't but. know that they were such hometown heroes like they <laughs> so good. but yeah they all came together and that was great like you see all of these things in the airport the Thunder Bay Public Library does a lot of work um, but all of those things I won't say are bad things either but they aren't the really hard, uncomfortable, meaningful work that I think the city and the indigenous youth in the city especially need to see. So. Do you uh, have any ideas on the, the types of things, supports that could be in place for indigenous youth uh, as someone who grew up there yourself, uh, you know, coming from the north perhaps to, to go to school, um, supports that they could, could use? Yeah, um, well, there are all of the things that I 
going to mention, I think, are sort of in the works. I know uh, they've talked for a long time about a student residence for uh, the kids at DFC so that they don't have to be in these boarding homes and stuff, often with white families. And um, that's something that I think is coming and mm -hmm. that they're at least very seriously discussing right now. Another thing, the number one thing, actually, that I've always heard when I've gone and talked to kids at DFC um, is about the transportation system, actually, um, and about how to they need better access to the services in the city. They need better places to, the, the transport system is just garbage, pretty yeah. much so. That, and then also the police. And the police right now are in this, I think, I hope, like reworking, rebuilding sort of phase after the two reports that came out in December. Yeah. Uh, so we're at like this little tipping point maybe for all of these really important, meaningful changes that I was hoping to see. But I guess, I guess that's yet to be seen. <laughs> Uh, as we mentioned off the top of the show, and as you can hear, uh, Riley's quite a, a public speaker. And uh, after the break, we're going to hear from one of her speeches that uh, she recently gave in the House of Commons during the Daughters of the Vote. And we'll hear that when we come back to you face to face. Indigenous women are five times more likely to go missing or to be murdered. In every statistic, speaking to areas of inequity, Indigenous women are overrepresented. It was estimated that there were at least 1,181 Indigenous women and girls in Canada known to either have been missing or murdered. 1,181. If you remember anything from the next one minute, remember that number. Remember that that number is high enough to fill every seat in this room three times over. Remember that Indigenous women make up only 2% of the female population in Canada, but make up about a quarter of all female homicide victims. Remember that the kin of the victims called the inquiry into their disappearances and deaths of their loved ones inaccessible, re-traumatizing, and a waste. Remember that that number is not a number, that that is our mothers, our aunties, our sisters, our friends, and our daughters. And remember that Canada is responsible for our loss of them and that it still fails to deliver them justice. 1,181. We just heard some of Riley Yesno's speech at the Daughters of the Vote in the House of Commons. And Riley, you were discussing missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And why was that what you wanted to spend your time in the House of Commons speaking about? Yeah. Uh, I have spoken a lot or done a lot of research on the issue of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls before. It's what I think really got me passionate about activism or advocacy work was the issue. But also for this event specifically, it was a, an event that was supposed to be focused on women and girls and talking about that. And so it seemed relevant and it was, you know, coming up on the release of the inquiries uh, report. Um, and also just the day after that Jody wilson Raybould uh, was kicked out of caucus. So uh, all of these things sort of culminated to make it, I thought, a very pertinent topic to bring up in that space. What was it like speaking in that space that many people don't get a, a chance to do? Yeah, um, I, it was for sure intimidating just because not too many people do get to speak in that space, but I was actually very uncomfortable with with the whole situation before I went in. I didn't know if I really wanted to do it. Uh, I, I felt very uncomfortable in the coloniality of the House of Commons. I don't think you can get much more colonial than that. And um, just knowing the history of those spaces and the sort of decisions that were made there that like were denied Indigenous women the right to vote until the 1960s, that put my grandparents in residential school for decades. And knowing that Indigenous women and Indigenous people were not supposed to be in that space um, it also, there was a lot of intensity in this idea of reclaiming that space and being able to hold Canada accountable and scrutinize them coming from an Indigenous voice um, in their own house. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you know, Jody Wilson-Raybould and, uh, and uh, Bill Pott, and I've seen uh, an interview with you in the past where you too said you one day wanted to be a, a member of Parliament. Yeah. Is that uh, still something you're looking to get into? Uh, no. <laughs> Hard no these days. Uh, I do look back at those interviews and I remember 
feeling so passionate and having so much conviction about this idea of politics as our, our greatest catalyst for change and recognize that that's how I was feeling at the time, but I still look back and I'm like, oh my God, why did you ever say that? But I just at the time thought that I think a lot of young, the way I think a lot of young people feel that, you know, politics is our greatest catalyst for change. And, you know, everyone will tell you when you're growing up, if you're like somewhat successful or whatever, that, oh, you're going to be the prime minister one day. And mm -hmm. so I had this very romantic idea of what politics was as a change making vehicle. And then the more I learned about politics and interacted with politicians and the political world, the less and less I believed that. Um, and specifically for me, I can, I can see how it is um, it's one agent of change, but I don't think it's the best one for me, and I don't think it's the best one, period. So, You uh, got to see a little bit of the inner workings, I guess, of it all, yeah. on the uh, Prime Minister's Youth Advisory Council. Uh, yeah. What was that experience like for you? Um, it, was, it was really, I will say it is probably the most formative experience I've ever had in my life, to, to go from a high school student, an Indigenous high school student from the North, one day, to kind of sitting at the table with the Prime Minister the next was huge for me. It was the biggest thing I had ever done at that point. But um, it was also like really difficult at times trying to navigate that space. I um, had like some really hard conversations there. I learned a lot about power <laughs> in those spaces. And uh, it made me a bit of a, a recovering anarchist these days, I'll say, because of it. But a uh, huge learning experience and also opened up, if, if anything, it was a platform that opened up all of these other doors that allowed me to be able to do the work that I do now and that I want to do in the future. So you've done TEDx talks. So what, how did you come to have this voice, I guess, that you have? Yeah, I guess I, I haven't even necessarily figured it out because it just feels like I don't ever think that I necessarily pursued any of these things, that they all just kind of happened. I think it's really a time to be, uh, quite a time in Canada, to be a young Indigenous person. Everybody is looking for those sorts of voices. And so I think a lot of it was a lot of the right place and the right time. And it's been interesting because going from, I started all of this when I was about 17, 16. Um, and over the course of even just a few years have really had to like come into my own voice and my learning in a very public sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, and so the more I did it though, the more empowered um, I felt, the more gaps I noticed, um, and the more people that I met that I felt should be in those spaces as well. So it was like a very natural, in the most unnatural of senses, uh, way, journey of getting there. Mm -hmm. Has it been uh, difficult or, or challenging for you at times to uh, you know, be called upon as, oh, here's our Indigenous youth that's coming to speak to us, or, or have people who feel like, uh, you know, they too want to have a voice. Yeah, it's been incredibly difficult. Um, and it feels weird to complain and say, like, it's been really difficult because I know um, that you just look at that and you're like, oh, these are incredible opportunities. You get to speak to some places where people could only, like, dream of speaking. And it's, it's entirely true. Um, but I think that there's a lot of uh, weight that falls on your shoulders when you do that that I know a lot of other Indigenous young people would attest to as well. The responsibility you feel to represent you and not just you though your entire community all indigenous young people because so often it's just this one token person that gets into these spaces mm -hmm. um the other part is you become uh, really a hot spot for scrutiny online that was a huge one for me for sure when i first started publishing things and people having people come up to me on on twitter or in facebook and just saying like these really horrible awful things was a big learning curve um but then also i think for me, I'm realizing now in my part of my learning is that who do I want to be speaking to? Do I always want to be speaking to non-Indigenous Canadians and educating them on, on Indigenous issues? Because I think that's a really important job. But I would also be, love to be able to hold space and you know, community organize within the Indigenous community itself, which I think I so rarely get to do. Um, yeah. We're going to take another quick break and then we'll return here on... Hidden behind their screens, hordes of Canadians have taken to Facebook and Twitter to defend the police and the mayor, while also subjecting the indigenous population to endless hate. Strangers make violent assumptions or pose egregiously racist questions under the guise of ignorance or curiosity. Wondering what young Bradham Jacob was doing in the park, 
I suspect it had something to do with obtaining drugs or alcohol, writes one Twitter user. There's no space to grieve. There is no pause to mourn. Canadian society and the city of Thunder Bay won't let us. It's easy to count visibility as a win, and in some ways it is. But we must all try to remember that with visibility comes vulnerability. And in this city, and indeed all of Canada, it is the Indigenous people who are already the most vulnerable. The thing about Thunder Bay is that it doesn't matter how many facts you present it with, how many reports are prepared, or how many Indigenous kids wind up dead. The city, in many ways, cannot be reasoned with. It must be forced to change. Until the city can admit the truth and tangible progress starts to be made, things will continue to be hard, if not harder, for the Indigenous community in Thunder Bay. So be outraged that the mayor thinks that Thunder Bay has a reputation problem rather than a racism problem. Be infuriated by the headlines and the news that never seems to be good. Be happy that with any luck, positive changes will be seen in the police service. But more than anything, look beyond the stories and remember the actual Indigenous people who live in Thunder Bay and cities like it all across Canada every single day. Even when it's not fresh news anymore and you're finished listening to Canada Land or reading Seven Fallen Feathers, Indigenous people will still be here and they will still need your solidarity. Demand answers, demand justice, and send love to the Indigenous community in Thunder Bay, Braden Jacobs family, and to Wepikwe First Nation. You just heard Riley Yesno reading some of her article that she wrote on Thunder Bay. So what is next for Riley Yesno? Oh man. <laughs> I mean, I hope I graduate first, yeah. I guess. Um, but yeah, I really love the work I'm doing now with writing and researching um, and kind of getting to, to community build and network and meet other Indigenous people across the country is great. I hope if for a very like tangible thing that um, I get to do some journalistic or, or writing work. If we're talking about catalysts for change, I think that that, in my opinion, um, is the greatest one that I've seen. I really believe in the power of a story. So that would be the future, I hope. Riley, we just want to thank you again for being on the show. It was a real pleasure to have you on here. Thank you. Wish you all the best in the future. Fortunately, that's all the time we have for Face to Face this week. We're always looking for new guests. So if you have any ideas, shoot us an email at uh, news at aptn.ca. And a reminder that you can find this episode and past episodes as podcasts. You can uh, find those at aptn.ca slash face-to-face podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in.